globalization has left many poor people at the margins of development. This is particularly daunting in cities in developing countries. Most of the time, these urban poor communities live in hazardous areas, such as along the banks of the river, condemned buildings, and those far worse off under the bridge. Many cities are struggling to find ways to provide social housing for the poor. In today's Coffee Break, we will talk about this with Dr. Mary Reseles, a sociologist and anthropologist with decades of experience in this field of urban poor, urban planning, and urban development. Welcome back to Coffee Break with Urbana, where I'm having my virtual coffee break with Dr. Mary Reseles. She's a research scientist and uh, the former director, in fact, of the Institute for Philippine of Philippine Culture, and she's also a professor of uh, sociology and anthropology at the Ateneo de Manila University and the University of the Philippines. She has this vast experience on uh, community organizing, uh, working with urban poor communities, and both in Asia and Africa, right? And in, in, I remember uh, it, you also worked for UNICEF in, in Africa, and she's a consultant for uh, World Bank and UN and, uh, and Asian Development Bank. So right now, we're going to talk to Dr. Mary Reseles on what she's very passionate about for a long time, uh, urban poor communities and, and development and urban planning. Uh, so welcome to Coffee Break with Urbana, Dr. Reseles, uh, our, uh, the Philippines Jane Jacobs. <laughs> Really? Oh, wow. That's a compliment. <laughs> you know, one of the early books I read that really impressed me, I should yeah. say. Yeah. So welcome, Dr. Aceles. And uh, how are you? How are you dealing with, with this uh, quarantine? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you, you feel very bad about what's happening outside to everybody. But let's say me personally, it's like a, a breath of fresh air in the sense that I get to stay home and catch up on a lot of work and I, st you know, connect with my students, do NGO stuff virtually. So I'm fine, actually. Yeah. I try to do some writing, you know, if, with interviewing urban poor leaders. We put it on Rappler so that people hear what's happening there. You know, it's that's kind of your attempt to balance between your very privileged situation and the urban <laughs> poor situation, yeah, you know? Yeah, correct. So, um, right now, I, I just want to ask, how did this interest of working with the urban poor really start in your career? Oh, my goodness. It's really, that's a long time ago. I think in the, believe it or not, 60s, mid 60s. Mid -60s I was working at the Institute of Philippine Culture, mm -hmm. and you were doing, you know, research values and so on. And um, I was supposed to go out and do rural research. But by that time, I think I had like three children. I have five, but I had three. And, you know, five, my husband said, you're, how long are you going to be away? Three months? And what, you know, what about the kids? And, and I said, yeah, it's really terrible. At that moment, it happened that somebody from Procter & Gamble, which had a factory in Tundo, came to see Father Lynch to ask him, can somebody do a study of the urban area around Philippine Man PMC? We know the Mandarin soap and shampoo and things like that. He said, because you know what we're finding, it's a poor area. It was not an informal settlement. It was just a low income area of Tondo near the shore. He said, um, you know, people are, young kids are jumping on our trucks and they're kind of stealing the equipment. So now we have to cover it. Is that a mark that we are not popular or are they getting back at us at something because they're poor and we seem to be well, etc. right? So he kind of came with that problem. So Father Lynch, anthropologist, said, okay, because I told him, I don't think I can go to rural areas, you know. He said, how about this? This is urban. And sure, and that's how it all went. So I, the two of us went and began to go to Tondo. Uh, when people first heard that, they said, are you crazy? That's, you know, it's drugs and gangs and going on. And, but we went and, you know, what you, f and I think that's the first thing you find, the stereotypes of low-income neighborhoods are so false, yeah. right? They're yeah. ordinary people. So it's a, that was a big value change for me in the sense, not that I kind of looked, I just didn't know anything about it until I went there and then began to meet a lot of people and look at the structure of 
you know, behavior, what kept what brought people together, how did they identify themselves, who belongs, who doesn't belong, what's the sense of community. So I did that study, and I think it's the first urban article I ever published was in this um, City as Center of Change in Asia in 1960. Was it 70 maybe or 65? Anyway, so that was it. That's how I got into urban. And at the time, there was really nobody else in urban studies in anthropology. So I was there as a first. So that's how it started. Yeah, so you pioneered this urban sociology and urban anthropology in in the Philippines, in fact, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. I never thought of it that way, but I think in, in effect, yes, because uh, the next one who did it was uh, Hokano, Pepe Hokano, yeah. F. Landa. Mm -hmm. And he really stayed, you know, he really did do what anthropologists do. Too. He lived in the community in Santa Ana and wrote a whole ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, but he came after me, you know, so we were really the first two. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, the one of the things I think that came out in that article was having, having studied sociology at Cornell just before that as an undergrad, you know, you study the Chicago school and all those circles and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the secularism and, um, you know, Max Weber, what happens when people move to the city, it becomes impersonal, secondary, all of that, no? Mm -hmm. And when I went to the community, I found it's not, in other words, the notion of urban enclaves, which was already being discussed with, what's his name in Boston, was he wrote a book on urban enclaves, and I remember I read that. And then when I went to Tondo, I said, yeah, that's the way it is. They're in the city, but they're not, you know, and people think of it, they're rural, those are all rural values. Mm -hmm. But I would say, no, it's not rural values, because some of them have been there 10, 20 years, but even if they're migrants, you know, it's, it's, these are city ways of behaving. Yeah, so I think right, in that, right. I be, was probably one of the first to rethink this uh, whole notion that cities are impersonal and secular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, the, but that was all coming out of the United yeah, States, yeah. you know, which it essentially was a highly industrialized society, even then, the 1960s, my goodness. And so... And then farming, rural in, yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. then, were really large farms. In the South, there were small farm, farming households. You know, that's another story. But they were mainly big farms and uh, family farms, which were transitioning into with machinery and all of that because labor was getting less because people were moving to the cities. But that model didn't really fit. When we all learned that, if you studied in the U.S. in sociology, that's what you learned, you know? because it was coming out of their, their context. And that's why when you come back in those days, those of us who are social scientists, uh, of course, more on the graduate level, mm -hmm. you, you come back and you kind of have to unlearn it or rethink it anyway. And then, so we were always cast in having to write articles about, well, this is a generalization, but in reality, uh, in the Philippines or in the South, it's, very, it's really like this. But the framework was always there, and where do we fit into that or not? Yeah. Now, fortunately, by now, we've gotten away from that. No, but that was the context then. Mm -hmm. So in the Philippines, when you, get, you went back to the Philippines in the 60s or in, in the... Yeah, you, yeah, you went well, back in the 60s, right? Uh, right, to, yes, because yes. I was in the U.S. in high school and college, and then I went back yeah. in the, in the so, 60s, yeah, so oh, in the you, late 50s. Yeah, so when you went back to the Philippines and you started working on uh, urban poor communities, the what were the very striking difference that you saw from your undergrad in in the U.S. and and the way cities are formed in the Philippines? Well, uh, I mean, at the very micro level, neighborhoods are were very active, vital, you know, and people knew one another. And so that whole notion of yeah. uh, the secondary relationships that dominate, you know, you found that was not the case, although uh, definitely the primary ties are still there and they have to get, they, they have to get adjusted to finding new networks. I mean, now we look more at networks. People have networks within and networks outside and, you know, bridging and bonding. If you know yeah. all of that in sociology, yeah. that's more the, orientation. So 
you begin to find us different. But one of the things that I then learned, since I was beginning to publish and give talks about what I found out in Tundo, that, you know, basically, uh, these are people struggling, they're poor, they're struggling to get ahead. Many of them were originally migrants, but many are not migrants. Many of them are, as one said, eh, we have always been here. So why do they always think we're migrants? Because they were not, or not all. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, well, then one day, Dennis Murphy, who is a community organizer, the late, and a couple of other organizer came to me and we met in some workshop or something and they said you know Mary you're always writing and it's it's good that you're very positive about the urban poor these are low-income urban poor not informal settlers right yeah. they said but we work with informal settlers mm -hmm. and uh, we're organizing and in our view uh, they should be the ones making points about themselves mm -hmm. it really mm -hmm. shouldn't be you telling the world about them. They should be asserting who they are because they have certain uh, you know, aims, which is mainly to get security of tenure. Yeah. So I was kind of taken aback, you know? Um, and they, so I said, well, so what do you want me to do? And they said, well, why don't you come join some of the meetings, come to, uh, that was the zone one, Tondo, not the famous. And so there, they were organizing there to get access to the land, land tenure. And I think that's when I really learned the power of organizing because I saw what happened when people got a sense of power that they could, by acting together and strategizing and, get, you know, that they, they were able to accomplish a lot. And so the, ever since, I mean, I, that, that view that, you know, urban poor are kind of ordinary people but have special problems. Yeah. And, and, but, but if you, if they get the tools to, to think through their own issues um, and the strength and the how say the confidence to move ahead through various kinds of actions, mm -hmm. they accomplish tremendous things. That's yeah. one. And then the yeah. other, just sitting on so many meetings with NGOs and them, as as an academic, just listening to that, I began to think this is really where theory is generated. You know, all the stuff that I'm teaching in Ateneo at the time which is drawn largely at that time, the 70s already, from foreign, you know, US, Europe, books mainly, you know, you, you have to keep transposing it. Whereas why don't we start from here, listen to what they're saying and draw theory, not grand theory necessarily, but build up, uh, you know, knowledge based on what's actually there. So ever since I've been involved in, with the er, informal settlers particularly, I think um, that's very interesting to note because I had the same experience when we did the uh, Typhoon Haiyan rebuilding. I I just uh, left the bank that time and then I went I went on field and uh, and we were able to talk to a lot of the informal settlers, in fact, um, along the coast. So if you recall that time, the they declared uh, 40 meters from the shoreline is a no-build zone right away in, 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 in just, I think, a week after the typhoon Haiyan. And it's very interesting because when we did the rebuilding, I also wrote a paper on it, not exactly on, on our project, but I took a more uh, urban sociology point of view. So I looked at it, people with a higher social capital and human capital have uh, are able to rebuild much faster than the rest of the community so we did yeah, papers yeah. on that and and in fact it's 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 true so you you will see that they have their own little networks but there's also there's also uh, one of the interesting findings that we found there was that there are communities that of course are faster to be able to, or they were able to rebuild much mm. faster than the rest. Uh, but there are also other communities that were able to rebuild on their own. So was that there are households who were able to rebuild on their own, but not collectively. Yeah. So, so there's a difference on on the level of collectivity or community. 
So, mm-hmm. but both mm-hmm. have the same high social capital because, you know, they were, they have, they have networks, but not as a community. You know, so. Yeah, and you know, getting government to recognize that is, is you know, I, it seems to be so difficult. Yeah. Uh, although more and more, of course, now it, that is recognized. But the thing is, People can build their own houses, yes. and some and you know Tao Filipina helps them a lot on the design, and they're strong; they won't collapse, and so on. But in the end, if the land issue is not settled and they're unsure, um, and if you know a sanitation system is not built in, yes. if the roads are not at least footpaths are paved, etc., and that's they can't do. I mean, that's not that they can't; it just costs too much. I mean, that is a function of a local government. You know? And that's what we keep saying, that people can really build their own houses, give them some technical assistance, the materials that are stronger, they can do it, because they do it anyway, as we know, you know, and we just have to help them build it stronger or better, but they can't really tackle they, uh, the rest on their own. They have to lobby yeah. for attention to, to that. Although many times they also raise their own funds just to little by little, you know, mm-hmm to pave that little road, mm-hmm. to put more water there, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but people have tremendous capacity. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah, thank you for mentioning Tao Pilipinas, our friends from Tao Pilipinas. Hello. <laughs> um, oh, good. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're um, also our friends. Um, and uh, in, your, in your experience, because you work with, in Africa, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is there a difference in on how they deal with the urban poor in Africa, uh, how the local governments deal with the urban poor in Africa and the and in Asia. Is I don't think so. I mean, at least not when I was in Nairobi and, and that was in the, what, 80s and 90s. I, I, the irony is, is the Center for Housing is based internationally in Nairobi. Mm-hmm. And yet Nairobi, Kenya, had the largest slum areas or informal settlements. And, you know, they could, they could never really resolve that. Um, it's the same thing. The notion that land uh, belongs to the government, yeah. and, yeah. Of, and which is why people settle there, because they kind of feel that well, with government you can negotiate somehow or fight. With when, once private property is already decided, designated in the country as important, it's much harder to fight there. But with government you can maneuver because they they need your vote and they know that you know, even and so they don't get. But they're universally the same. not well treated. They're really not for the most part given access to resources. Although over the last I would say 50 years there has at least been a recognition that they have rights, you know, mm-hmm. that, I mean, you know, in the mm-hmm. 50s or 60s, when I started here, when you would say something to advocate for something in the informal settlements, they say, why would you put water there? You know, if, if you put any facilities, they're going to want to stay. They should leave. They shouldn't be there. That notion, they're illegal. They should be out of there. They have no right. That has changed a lot. Yeah. I think worldwide. Yeah. Partly because people do what they do, they stay there, they don't move, or they fight. And more and more, I mean, the UN systems and you know, progressive architect people, so on, and NGOs have managed to change those orientations somewhat. That they have rights, but access to resources—that's another story. And the Philippines, access to housing. I mean, you know, decent housing in the city, not outside. That's still an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but it ha- uh, there are there are cities in the Philippines that are also offering in-house uh, relocation sites, right? Because I re- I recall in Navotas in Metro Manila, yeah. the uh, the community that I talked to you earlier before we went online is um, they were they used to settle in the isla. Uh, uh, Isla Pulo in Navota. So it's a, it's a very, it's a really highly um, disaster prone area because it's an, it's mm. an island um, and they're there. So it's like they're only connected to the inland by a one kilometer, around one kilometer uh, bamboo, bamboo uh, bridge. 
So, mm-hmm. but now they were able to transfer to uh, I think a Habitat for Humanity housing, also mm-hmm. near 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 the isla. And it's interesting because I I, I remember going there in 2015. Um, the the project that we had started in 2013, something like that, or 2012. Uh, and then we went back in 2015 after they have already re- relocated to the Habitat for Humanity. And my goodness, the the shoreline really shortened. It was it was almost at the at the edge of the disaster resilient livelihood center that we put up so mm. really the effect of climate change you can observe right in just a span of what three years it's yeah. already and it was really good that they were able to transfer right away to to the new housing and uh, and maybe next time I, as i mentioned we have to talk to them again um, as a group and talk to to the community in 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 one of our sessions in coffee break sessions. But let me let me ask you. Um, you talked uh, you talked about uh, decongestion in 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 the article in the interview that you had with Nicole, who's also a friend of mine. Um, what's your view on that? Because that's always always the issue that that uh, that the urban poor communities should be relocated outside. That's always the the, yeah. the the strategy that the city governments are taking. To be fair, there are city governments, then there are cities really that have that lack the space. Like for example, in Pateros, it's very small. So where will you put them? It's their 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 uh, their problem is uh, is space for their own. Um, residents and uh, for the informal settle- settlers uh they, they they don't know where to put them because it's so small it's a, i remember it's a just 160 hectare uh town township <laughs> in, mm. in the middle of metro manila so how 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 what's your view on that the congestion well decongestion that's a very popular term today because i don't know have you followed this latest balik provincia yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah. All right. I mean, there is a case where all of a sudden the administration is saying, you know, all the, the those areas are too congested because they couldn't really feed them all. I mean, you know, they suddenly had lockdowns almost overnight. Yeah. So people who earn on a daily basis couldn't go out. Yeah. And therefore, of course, government had to find a way of feeding them. And a lot of private donors were also coming in. But the concept, you know, that the coming out with these places are so congested they should return to the province balik provincia and it's now you know a new uh, version too and and you say well for those who want to go yeah fine have facilitate but uh what are they returning to huh yeah. the, the provinces are also they have a lot of poverty there i mean two-thirds of poverty in the philippines is still rural all right so what you're going to send back urban poor uh, voluntarily and if they don't have jobs already prepared for them or decent yeah. housing why should they go back you know so if that that's a whole big program you don't just do that overnight you know and they have short medium and long term strategies yeah. but the fact that they're already moving people that you know and they're supposed to have a one month planning and and so we had a meeting today or we having meetings in there's a something going to the IATF that um, you know because it's formed it was formed that as a response to COVID yeah. that there are so many cases there and therefore if you can relieve that by returning them to the province uh, and they recognize you have to develop it there but what we're saying is okay but that has nothing to do with the people who want to stay in the city, who came here because this is where the opportunities are, they came here, some of them, 50 years ago. They have been there 40 years, 60. Their kids have been born there, raised there. The kids have no sense that, of a province. Mm-hmm. They don't relate to the province. They would, you know, so they're really urban people. And we know that urban places are where 
are best able to handle huge populations, right? So the issue is not that there are so many of them. The issue is that basically government has not recognized its responsibility over the last 60 years to provide decent housing or secure tenure on site where they can build on their own with some help from local government or you know, nearby relocation, near their jobs, which they already have. Uh, and the fact that they use the money that people lobbied for uh, with the previous administration, and, and it was really the previous administration, unfortunately, that pressured them to, uh, well, N NHA got the money because they were the housing one, and they bought land because it's cheaper out there, relocated people, but with very little attention to the socioeconomic issues. Yeah. And we know yeah. studies have been done, 50% return to the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. why on earth, and now we're saying, why on earth are you having a Balik Provincia program without planning it better? Correct. Not that Correct. you have it, no? Because the evidence of that out-of-town relocation has been so mm -hmm. poor. Look at Marawi City. Yeah. And now the oh. displaced persons who are there saying, send the Babalik sila. Who's coming here? Yung taga Manila na may COVID baka? And, and tayo, uh, kami naman, we're still in the displacement camps. What is the priority? You know, and, uh, so those are some of the things that are coming up because of this. The, and it requires really a large urban yeah. rural planning. Yeah. No? The, I, and one of okay. the, I don't know if, yeah, did you see the article I wrote on that? Balik Provincia? Not yet. I mean, uh, yeah. Not yet. Oh, I, I, I was in Rappler. Yeah. Oh, because I, I reacted when I first saw that. Yeah. You know, and I said, if they think that Bolik Provincia is rural, it's not. It, it's, we're looking now at small and medium-sized cities. Very valid. Those should be developed because that's where people would go with some industrial base and so on. You know, uh, because if you think people are going to farm, they're not, right? If, if there, where is there no more, there's no more land available at the moment. So people are already going into the uplands, disturbing the whole ecology of the uplands and creating more viruses let loose on the population. So, you know, these things have to be thought out. And they have, as far as we know, they haven't called on any of the people I know, uh, scientists, biologists, you know, and all of that, urban planners. Yeah, exactly. Matter. Yeah. Because I, I don't understand also um, if, if, if they're going to go back and there's no definite plan, social development, economic development plan in, in the area. Uh, a lot of urban planners, we've studied this uh, for a long time, that, you know, having those little growth poles in, 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 in the provinces and, and uh, that's the only way, really, for us to have uh, to develop these provinces and to also avoid the, having these people go to big cities because there are we have to create opportunities in the, yeah. in the provinces. So that's how I think um, urban planning and 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 urban sociology and or you know th th this entire thing all merge together. And and it's it's for me it's a it's a very interesting uh, subject matter in 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 planning. Uh, that's yeah. it's, and it's also the one of the biggest challenge because yeah. because uh, you're dealing with real people and real problems. Not just in the city, but the smaller nodes in the cities that we have to tap because they also have a voice. We have to listen to them as uh, as urban planners, as architects, uh, especially yeah. if we are if we really want to delve into.